Greetings and salutations, friends. Ready for some more real-life lore? <laughs> I noticed in the previous video, when I was talking about the war in Ukraine, that there were quite a few people not familiar with some of the terms being used. Understandable, especially since terms like brigade and battalion no longer refers to just the size of a formation, but is also often an indication of how it fights and operates. So, in case of future videos on the subject, and simply because it's interesting, today we are going to talk about the Russian Battalion Tactical Group. The spearhead, or perhaps more appropriately, the sledgehammer of the Russian Federation's armed forces. We will talk about their history, their equipment, their tactics, their intended purpose, and how that's been working out. So, without further ado, let's get into it. The reforms that would eventually see the formation of Battalion Tactical Groups, or BTGs, began in 2008, when the Russian army initiated a large-scale reorganization to move away from the big formations of the previous Soviet-style military with partially staffed divisions and regiments. Instead, they would move towards the smaller formations of brigades and battalions which would be fully staffed and combat ready at short notice. This was viewed by us over here in the West as the Russian army beginning to modernize along Western lines, as we also prefer to organize our military mostly along the lines of brigades and battalions. It was also seen as the Russian army moving more towards counter-insurgency operations targeting small rebellious groups or terrorist organizations rather than large-scale military operations. Now, the precise size of these things, divisions or regiments or battalions, etc., can vary greatly. But to give an idea of scale, a division might be between 5 to 25,000 men, and would also have a massive command staff. In the old Soviet style, these divisions would be the primary command and control elements, with several regiments in each division becoming the main fighting force. So the division was in charge of guiding and deploying the regiments, which would then take care of the fighting. The regiments were then organized into specializations like motorized rifle regiment, or tank regiment, or artillery regiment, for example. The numbers of these would then again range from 1,300 to 2,500 men, depending on the type. There was a level of combined arms involved, like the motorized rifle regiments having a tank battalion, but by and large the idea was for several regiments to operate together under the unified command of the division to achieve its objectives. This is a very large formation, designed to engage other very large formations in set-piece classical battles. And to organize all of this, they also had very large command staffs and a ton of bureaucracy and logistics. Meanwhile, the battalion brigade setup is a lot smaller. A brigade might be nothing more than three to 5,000 men which are then divided into several battalions underneath the brigade. So the brigade performs the same function as the division, but on a smaller scale, and with only a fourth or less of the personnel. Now, these reforms were only partially completed. The old division's level system gave a lot of high-ranking officers very cushy jobs and very large officers, and they were none too pleased with the changes being made. Add in the rising tension with NATO over the War of the Little Green Men in 2014, and the Russian army settled upon a strange both-ways system, where the new brigades and their battalion tactical groups would serve alongside Soviet-era-style armies, now named Combined Arms Armies, made up of divisions and regiments. This half-in, half-out solution appears to have led to some pretty serious problems that we will return to a bit later. For now, let's move on to figuring out precisely what a battalion tactical group is, and why it has had so many higher-ups in NATO worried during the 2014 and onwards conflict in Ukraine and the Donbass-Luhansk area. To start with, the main organizational entity, the command and control center, is the brigade. This provides the strategic level direction that the division did to the old regiments, but this is where things take a sharp turn from the normal. 
Usually, the Brigade would be the smallest deployable combat-ready formation, and be expected to operate as a whole, with the battalions or the smaller companies being the maneuver elements of the Brigade, and all support like artillery or anti-air would have to be provided via Brigade Headquarters or Division Headquarters, as they tend to not have access to all that much in the way of heavy hardware. But instead, the Russian Brigade seen in 2014 conflict created one and occasionally two battalion tactical groups and used these as their primary fighting forces, as they up-armed them to a comical degree. Let me show you what I mean. A BTG consists of one tank company, three mechanized infantry companies, one anti-armor company, three batteries of field artillery, one battery of MLRS artillery, and two anti-air batteries, along with a sizable suite of electronic warfare weaponry, drone surveillance, and attached logistics, engineering, and medical elements. That's a lot of assets in a very small package. Compare this to the US Army's Brigade Combat Team. This is a much larger formation, three to four times the men, but it is still, again, the smallest operational unit deployed by the US Army. There are a couple of variations on these, but the closest equivalent would probably be the Striker Brigade Combat Team, mechanized infantry, essentially, or the SBCT for short. It has one anti-armor company, two combat engineer companies, nine mechanized rifle companies, one cavalry squadron, the rough equivalent of a company, and three artillery batteries attached to brigade headquarters. As you can see, the SBCT has less tanks, less artillery, and no dedicated anti-air, despite being a much larger formation, again, three to four times larger than the Russian Battalion Tactical Group. And of course, the ideal scenario pursued by the Russian battalion commander is a defeat in detail, where his battalion fights one US battalion, where he will have infantry parity, an absolutely devastating superiority in tanks and artillery, whilst warding off US air superiority with dedicated AA batteries, overwhelming the US battalion swiftly with superior firepower and flexibility before moving on to the next battalion. Things even out a little bit if you look at the second combat team, which is the Armored Brigade Combat Team, the ABCT, which has two mechanized rifle companies and two tank companies per battalion, but still no AA and no direct support artillery. Now, of course, it's not like the US commander would just sit quietly by and watch his outmatched brigades be targeted one by one, but this is where the maneuver part of modern combat comes in. And we're not going to get into that here, as the theoretical of a brigade combat team versus a battalion tactical group is a bit beyond the scope of this video. But the point is that the Russian BTG, battalion tactical group, has placed so much support flexibility, artillery, and armor into a battalion-level formation that on paper, in terms of firepower, it rivals a brigade four times its size. That is unsurprisingly a rather frightening proposition for anyone that needs to go up against it, and at least on paper, it seems like a very good idea, and for multiple reasons as well, not all of which is directly combat related. For example, it solves a long-standing problem in the Russian army, namely that the quality of the conscripted troops tend to be rather poor, yet also make up a very large portion of the army, 50% or more within regular army formations, and even within elite formations like the VDV. As many as a fourth of the serving personnel may be conscript soldiers. Now, the Russian army has made many attempts to whittle this percentage down, but they haven't been particularly successful so far. And naturally, you might not want to bring along potentially unwilling and or poorly trained men on a sharp combat mission. Yet, if those men also make up half of your fighting strength, you've got a problem. 
the BTG solves this very neatly by leaving the conscript behind on garrison detail or operating the support equipment, whilst the contract soldiers make up the mechanized combat infantry and the tank forces. Now we also need to pause here a quick moment to explain what I mean with contract soldier. A contract soldier differs from a conscript soldier in that he is a volunteer. He has signed up for a contracted period of service for either two, three or five years. In other words, the contract soldiers are the professional soldiers, the ones that know their craft and want to be there. Now, this, as you can probably see, also leads us to another little problem. How do you maintain the fighting efficiency of a unit if 50 to 25 percent of your troops cannot be relied upon, or even worse, deployed at all? You see, theoretically, technically, according to Russian law, conscripts may not serve in military actions outside of the border of Russia. It is illegal. Now, whether or not the Russian army follows that uh, law to the letter is a matter of some debate, but still, what do you do if up to 50% of your formation can't be deployed? Well, again, the Russian solution was to provide the fighting part with the kind of heavy ass support normally reserved for brigades or divisions, which allows the BTG to hammer down and destroy any equivalent sized troop with frightening speed and force. We will get into precisely how they try to do this with some examples from the Donbass campaign, but first let's have a super quick and dirty look at the Russian hardware involved to give you an idea of what we are dealing with here. Starting with the queen of the battlefield and star of the BTG system, the artillery. Ever since the time of Napoleon's grand batteries, the power of massed arty has been undisputed, and the Soviet army of old was particularly fond of their big guns. During their final assault against Berlin, for example, the Red Army amassed over 9,000 artillery pieces, firing 16,000 shells a minute against the German defenders of the Silo Heights. And with such a pedigree, it's hardly surprising the Russian army of today also has a liking for the old drum fire doctrine. In the battalion tactical groups, each of the three self propelled gun batteries will be made up of six guns per battery with their attached staff. The guns themselves are likely to be a mix of the older but still in active service Akatsia, 152mm self propelled howitzer, originally designed back in the late 1960s, although the version in current day service has been significantly upgraded since then, with its gun and fire control systems replaced and improved. There is also the newer Mister. This howitzer system entered service in 1989 and is a far more modern self-propelled gun. Better than its predecessor in nearly every way, higher rate of fire, better range, and a much wider selection of specialized ammunition, including long-range smart precision munitions. The Akatsia is definitely starting to get quite long in the tooth, but the Mister, at least on paper, is a fine modern artillery piece, plenty capable of delivering rapid and accurate indirect fire on short notice, as well as direct fire, as demonstrated quite often in the Donbass campaign. Then we have the single battery of MLRSs, with eight vehicles probably made up of the BM-21 Grad, which is quite reminiscent of the venerable Katyusha of the Second World War. And to be honest, uh, not much has necessarily changed. It's a 40 tube launcher firing 122mm rockets at a rate of 2 per second. And whilst the accuracy is still so and so shotgunny, the range has improved significantly, doubled in fact from the original 20 km to 40 km for HE frag munitions. And frankly, who cares about accuracy anyways, that's what the misters are for. The BM-21 is there to shell shock the shit out of a position before the infantry rolls in, and with a single battery capable of pumping out 22 tons of rockets in a single minute, it doesn't matter if the design is old, it still works. 
onto the tanks and anti-tank elements, the first would probably be stocked with another old and familiar vehicle, the T-72 tank. It too has undergone some pretty radical upgrades over the years, and current most modern variants is the T-72B3 and the B3M. The biggest changes is an upgraded autoloader system capable of handling more modern ammunition, and also the reflex anti-tank guided missile fired from the cannon barrel. Along with new gunner sight and radio equipment, plus improved protection in the form of explosive reactive armor. Now, this was supposed to be the newer uh, relic era, but it seems that many of the tanks are still using contact ERA, which has proven less than satisfactory. In the Donbass-Luhansk war, it was reported on several occasions that knocking out a T-72 required several hits, sometimes as many as two or three to finally disable the vehicle, whereas in the current conflict, not quite so much is looking like. The T-72 is still a decent tank, albeit it certainly has seen its best days quite a while ago, and the newer T-80s and T-90s might also be able to pick up the slack. For the anti-tank role, the Battalion Tactical Group will probably use the 9K114 Sturm. This fancy little thing is a… well, the delivery system essentially for the 89 Spiral to 80 GM. This is a Saklos missile specifically designed to engage and destroy modern armored vehicles and their countermeasures, including, of course, explosive reactor armor at a range of 6 kilometers. <laughs> Nothing more to say about that, really. It's an 80 GM. Missile goes whoosh, tanks go boom. <laughs> Still effective if more than a little cumbersome compared to stuff like the Javelin with the same effective range. Finally, the AA. I'm sure the Russian commander would prefer the Bleeding Edge Panzer AA system or the Tor, but may very well have to make do with older Strela, Osa or Buck systems. Against an enemy like Ukraine, this should be plenty, although maybe not. But against a truly modern opponent, a lot of these older and lighter systems are going to be woefully lacking. Nevertheless, the fact that a battalion level formation even has AA is very unusual. But, of course, the point of bringing all of these things together is to get a whole that supersedes the value of its component parts. So how is this done? We turn to the admittedly fragmented reports from the relatively low intensity constant skirmish war on the Ukraine Donbas Luhansk border, particularly the examples we have from 2014 and 15, as these are our best examples of a battalion tactical group in action. The preferred modus operandi appears to be first carrying out large-scale drone scouting of the enemy's operational area in its entirety, looking for any and all opportunities to strike out against their opposition. Due to the closely knit formation, the drone operators attached to the infantry will have immediate access to the BTG's artillery park and advanced warfare elements. No requests up the ladder or commanders sign off for any such delays. The drone operator spots a target, informs the battery officer, and five minutes later, rounds are on the way. This flexibility was shown to be particularly devastating in an example near Zelenopoly in 2014. A Ukrainian brigade was using the cover of darkness to ready themselves for offensive operations against nearby Russian and separatist forces. When at about 0400, the survivors reported later on that they heard what they thought to have been one or more drone engines overhead. Then, almost simultaneously, their closed comms radios all stopped working. In retrospect, this was a good indication it was time to run for their shelters, but unfortunately the Ukrainian army was pretty damn new to all of this in 2014. And a few minutes later, a couple hundred tons of shit descended from the sky, leaving an entire brigade combat ineffective through casualties to men and materiel in the space of minutes. 
Now, this was a particularly lucky situation for the Russians, but in repeated engagements in Donbass, the recipe repeated. The battalion tactical group would place itself opposite an enemy formation and then systematically break it apart piece by piece, using its overwhelming local strength concentrated against small formations to decimate the enemy one position at a time. This strategy has been referred to as siege tactics here in the West, and it is easy to see why, as again in 2014 and 15, they repeatedly carried out lengthy engagements, grinding down the Ukrainian defenders almost purely via artillery and rockets attacks, with very few outright assaults. And when they did do those, it was usually alongside partner forces, as the long-term offensive abilities of the BTG has some pretty serious concerns. So let us move on to an evaluation of the battalion tactical group. In an ideal scenario, the BTG will first locate the enemy via conventional scouting with light motorized forces or via cooperation with specialized reconnaissance acting alongside or attached to the BTG. Then, drones will be used to pinpoint and communicate positions of interest back to the artillery, which will engage and destroy the targets. Theoretically, the bombardment will then be followed up by fast-moving mechanized infantry mounted in the very effective BMP-3 infantry fighting vehicle. These would engage and overrun the shell-shock defenders in short order, denying effective enemy artillery fire with speed and aggression whilst warding off helicopter attacks and enemy air support with an umbrella of integrated air defense. Finally, the BTG's armored company will speed on past the captured position to exploit the opening created and seek out targets of opportunity and contact with the next enemy formation. Now you may note in the middle of there I said theoretically, because this is closer to the West's nightmare scenario interpretation of the BTG than its actual operational history. NATO and the US has a long and proud history of screaming bloody murder and collapsing into catatonic panic every time the Russian army displays a new multi-purpose wrench. Not that this has been entirely negative, mind you, as it has led us to continuously produce better and better combat systems. But it also does mean that we have a tendency to overestimate the capabilities of our enemies. In the case of the BTG, it has proven very, very hesitant to mount any sort of assault whatsoever using its mechanized infantry and or armor, as seen in the example of the Battle for the Donetsk Airport, where the BTG formation and separatist troops continued to pummel the target for months before finally, in a last-ditch gambit, sending tanks in directly to break the stalemate. This hyper-cautious approach is a very cost-effective way of waging war for the Russian army, which, unlike its Soviet predecessor, really does not have neither the men or the equipment to spare for pointless losses. But it does also indicate an unwillingness and or inability to dismount and fight aggressively, possibly due to the relatively small size of the BTG. The reports I have found suggest that out of the BTG's total of circa 900 men, maybe 400 to a max of 500 are infantry. Now that may sound like a lot, but it really isn't. Those 500 men need to continuously protect the remaining 400 from enemy infantry. Because as so thoroughly demonstrated in the current Ukraine war, armor and IFVs are extremely vulnerable to infantry anti-tank weapons. I've seen numbers suggesting that up to half of a BTG's manpower is usually allocated to just patrols and guard duty, leaving it with 250 men available for assault. Take into consideration the old but still gold rule requiring 3 to 1 superiority to guarantee the success of an attack on a prepared enemy, this means that 80 odd opposition fighters entrenched in positions resistant to artillery might bring an entire battalion tactical group to a complete halt. And worse yet, even when they can finally achieve local success, like during the lengthy battle of Debaltseve, where a Ukrainian armored brigade held out for five months under continuous pressure whilst being slowly encircled, eventually they were completely cut off and finally broken by massed artillery barrages and follow-up armored assaults. Yet, despite the Ukrainian brigade having to leave behind almost all of their heavy equipment, the brigade managed 
managed to retreat on foot in winter 30 kilometers through enemy held territory and establish a new defensive line to boot. The separatist soldiers and the Russian battalion tactical group proved completely incapable of maintaining an effective pursuit of an enemy on foot. How do we explain this? Well, theory crafting time, be in mind, but judging by all the current reports out of Ukraine the last three weeks, plus everything I have found from the 2014 to 15 conflict, I believe there to be three primary factors. The first I've already talked about, and that's training. I have grown very convinced of my original hypothesis that the Russian mechanized infantry troops are simply not adequately trained and led to conduct effective aggressive operations in the face of the enemy. Further compounding this is reason 2 and 3, immediate command and strategic level control. The battalion tactical group's biggest strength is all the tool it places at its commander's disposal. Armor, mechanized infantry, special reconnaissance, drones, artillery, MLRS systems, advanced electronic warfare, logistics, engineering elements, etc, etc, etc. But all of these elements also combine into a weakness just like it does a strength. Normally, this amount of stuff is handled by a low-ranking flag officer, the equivalent of a major general or brigadier general with a sizable command staff and half a dozen senior officers to which he can delegate tasks. In the case of a BTG, all of this is handed over to a single senior officer, who now has to delegate to junior officers operating formations meant for senior officers. In short, bringing out the full potential of a BTG is probably too big of an ask, taking into consideration the experience and the numbers of officers available to it, which, incidentally, might also be an explanation of why so many high-ranking Russian officers appear to have been killed in the current Ukraine conflict. They probably moved their own headquarters towards the front to help organize the units at the sharp end but in doing so did not take the necessary measures required for the safety of such desirable targets as they were in a bit of a hurry. Which leads us neatly to point 3. Directing tens of thousands of men scattered across divisions, regiments, brigades, battalions and companies, and keeping up to date with casualties, replacements and supply situations, whilst also trying to develop an idea of the enemy's numbers, positions and supplies, is hard very hard, and it can be made damn near impossible by shoddy communication, something the Russian army seems to have a big problem with. In the 2008 invasion of Georgia, the communications broke down to such a degree that Russian officers had to borrow the cell phones of journalists to call the private numbers of their soldiers in the field. And on at least one occasion, an officer had to request a helicopter so that he could be moved out to his troops to deliver the orders in person. This was supposed to have been fixed with the introduction of the Azat handset digital radio, but this system, which started development in 2012, has barely best case scenario, best possible numbers, produced no more than 60,000 sets. Even if we assume that all 60,000 are in perfect working condition right now, and all of them were issued to the army currently fighting in Ukraine, you would still not have enough of these to equip a fourth of the men fighting in that field. And from bad to worse, a lot of Russian equipment have different communication systems. The new stuff have modern day encrypted digital systems, whilst the old stuff is still operating analog radios. And of course, the two systems cannot talk to one another on the same level. So if one tank in the company has an old radio, now all the tanks in the company have to operate using that radio, since it simply can't pick up the systems of the more advanced ones, reducing the entire formation down to the lowest common denominator. And this is before, of course, we start thinking about what the opposition forces might be doing with jamming and electronic warfare, or worst yet, 
decrypting the comms of the Russians to reveal positions and possible high-value targets. Another potential explanation for the abnormal number of high-ranking officers apparently becoming casualties. This makes communication between units very challenging and coordination near impossible. This would be less of a problem in a traditional brigade and a larger formation, but for the battalion tactical group, with its severely limited number of infantry, much of which is needed to guard and secure all of those support assets, the BTG's offensive pushing power is extremely limited. It needs partner or fellow Russian forces to operate alongside it to provide flank protection and realign security. Without these things, any breakthrough, even if achieved, cannot be exploited without placing the BTG at tremendous risk of enemy maneuver elements swinging around its sides or, as we've seen in Ukraine, threatening its rear lines. Finally then, to wrap it all up, the Battalion Tactical Group appears to be a potentially very powerful formation that has demonstrated an ability to decimate much larger formations, four to five times the size, and the capabilities to bleed these opposition forces dry of men and materiel with very little cost to itself via the application of superior firepower and supporting elements. However, all of these advanced capabilities place a tremendous strain on a command system already groaning under the weight of outdated and unreliable technology, which further exacerbates another one of its main weaknesses, the severe lack of good old-fashioned meat. Placing their main strength, the support assets, at great risk, as there is simply not enough infantry to protect it all, and certainly not enough to also be actively engaging the enemy. And due to the limited numbers of the BTG, it is very vulnerable to casualties, especially when compared to its main opposition, the modern day combat team brigade. To truly come into its own, I believe the BTG is going to need a significant restructure. It needs a larger command staff, staffed by more experienced and higher ranking officers, and most importantly, it needs functional communication equipment. It also needs much easier access to reserves, which can really only be achieved by increasing the numbers of contract soldiers and increasing the numbers of replacement equipment, both of which are going to be very difficult because the military life in Russia is not necessarily tremendously popular. There have been many attempts to increase the number of contract soldiers which have had rather disappointing results. Additionally, the Russian military industry is simply not able to keep up with demand and is really struggling to develop the new promised Wundo weapons like the T-14 and even the Pantsir system has proven to be perhaps less than advertised. So, in total, the BTG performs well in the lower intensity conflicts of the Donbass region, where it could semi-rely on separatist partner forces, but it has not performed particularly well at all in the larger scale conflict of today, where particularly its offensive lack is really beginning to show, and its weakness to other formations of equal skill to their own employing many of their own tactics like drones and artillery seems to be something that the Russians have not grown accustomed to dealing with. <laughs> Ironically, the very tactics they used to such great effect against the early Ukrainian army in the 2014s and 15s are now being used against them because the Ukrainians learned their lessons. The Russians, unfortunately for them, appears to not have been able to do the same. And that is where I will wrap up this little analysis video on the Battalion Tactical Group. Hopefully you've enjoyed it, and if you did, please do consider leaving a like and a comment in the comment section down below. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.